All right, open up if you have your Bibles with you. I hope you do. Open up to 1 John chapter 4. We're going to continue our series through 1 John. If you've not been here uh, during this series, you're not as familiar with the Bible, that's okay. Uh, 1 John is toward the very back of the Bible. If you start in the very back and uh, the last book that you'll find is Revelation. It's a longer book. Uh, and just start turning backwards from there. You'll get to Jude, which is a very small book, maybe just one page. And then 3 John, 2 John, and then 1 John. And we want you to open up there to 1 John chapter 4. We're going to look at the first six verses uh, this morning. You know, I was thinking uh, back to my, to my childhood this week as I was reading these, these verses. Um, I grew up on a, on a farm or around a farm. My, my grandparents had farms. And so, so grew up around that. And uh, my, my granddad on my mom's side, my granddaddy Henson, we called him. He, uh, he, was a, he was a farmer and was all about farming. And, uh, and so he thought about animals, all kinds of animals, differently than, uh, than maybe you or I might think of animals. And I remember one time when I was, I uh, had to be in elementary school because it was before my, he had moved off the farm and my uncle had, had moved there to live. Um, he got bit by a snake. And I was, remember him telling me about it, and I was thinking, how in the world did you get bit by a snake? Uh, I always run from snakes, right? If I see a snake, I, I don't get close enough to it to get bit. So I was, and so he was telling me the story of how he got bit by a snake. He was cutting grass one day in his yard at his house, uh, and he saw a snake. And instead of running over the snake, he got off the lawnmower uh, and went and picked the snake up and moved it. But he didn't get bit. He continued cutting grass. He got finished cutting the grass for the lawn, Okay. And he went back to the snake and picked it up a second time to move it back where he had found it the first time. And that's when he got bit, right? Uh, And it wasn't a poisonous snake. It wasn't a dangerous snake. It was a a small snake. uh, And and it wasn't that big a deal. But I remember him telling me that story and me thinking, man, there's no way I'm going to try to pick up a snake, right? Uh, uh, Where I'm from, there are lots of uh, dangerous snakes, copperheads especially, and uh, cotton mouse or, or water moccasins. Uh, I can remember being in a boat fishing with my granddad or my uncles and, uh, and, and seeing water moccasins or cottonmouth swimming on the, on the water. Uh, so there's some dangerous snakes around where I'm, where I'm from, and, and I couldn't believe that, that, that he was okay with picking up a snake. But he, but he was telling me, and, and he, he helped me to understand that some snakes are good, especially on a farm. Snakes are good for, for controlling pests and, and different kinds of things. And he was helping me to see that you can tell the difference between snakes if you look close enough. Right, and he was saying that you know, uh, or I've heard—I don't know if he taught me this, but I've heard the saying before: uh, red next to yellow kills a fellow. Y'all have heard that before, right? The like coral snakes that have the red and and yellow and black bands on them. Uh, red next to yellow kill a fellow. Those are the coral snakes that are poisonous. Red next to black venom lack. And so those are not poisonous. There are other snakes that are mimicking those. Um, I, I remember learning that if you see a a, a snake with like a triangle-shaped head. That's a dangerous sign, right? It's like some kind of viper, copperhead, or something like that. Um, but, but not all snakes are bad. Some snakes are, are good. Uh, and, but you've got to be watchful and be mindful and be careful to tell them apart if you're going to pick one up and move it when you're, when you're cutting grass. Spiders are the same way. Uh, I, I think every time I ever see a spider, I kill it. Uh, but that's not how other people live, right? That's not how other people, uh, especially like farming people that know uh, things that I don't know. Uh, that's not how they live, right? Uh, but I remember being a kid and being taught about, uh, you know, like a brown spider with a fiddle pattern on the back. That's a brown recluse. It's a really dangerous spider. Stay away from it. I remember a black spider with an hourglass on the back is a, is a black widow. That's a dangerous spider. Stay away from it, right? Uh, some of the most dangerous looking spiders, I think, think it's called a wolf spider, like a big hairy spider. I think it's called a wolf spider. It looks really, really dangerous. Uh, but, they're, but I'm told they're not. I'm told they're beneficial. They're good. They, they uh, eat mosquitoes and stuff like that. And so there can be good snakes and bad snakes. There can be good spiders and, and bad spiders. But there are lots of dangerous ones. And if we're going to be around snakes or we're going to be around spiders, uh, we need to be able to tell them apart. Watch out for them and, and tell them apart. And John's given his readers here in this passage a a similar uh, warning. He's not talking about snakes or, or spiders. I don't know if there were snakes 
uh, where John was or, or spiders or, or not. I'm assuming there were. But that's not what he's talking about. He tells us to beware, to be watchful, to look out for, not to believe every spirit, but to test the spirits. He says they're good spirits and they're bad spirits. He talks about false teachers, many false teachers. There are good teachers and there are dangerous teachers. He tells us this in, in 1 John chapter 4. I'm going to read the first six verses. He says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that it is coming, and now it's already in the world. You are from God, little children, and you have overcome them. Because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. They are from the world. Therefore, they speak as from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. He who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. I only got two points this morning. Uh, point number one is look out. Point number two is look in. Look out and look in. First John tells us to look out, to watch out, to be careful. He says there are many false prophets that have gone out into the world, many false teachers that have gone out into the world. And because of this, he tells the church to be careful, to watch out, to test the spirits. When we see that word spirit, immediately comes to mind, I think, what's he talking about? What are, what are these spirits? Who are these spirits? Where do these spirits come from? There is, in the Bible, we, we, we see clearly, there is an unseen spiritual world around us. There is. And uh, that's not how a lot of people our day and age think. Uh, that's not even how some people in the, in the church think, right? Some, I mean, we would say, yes, of course, there's a spiritual world out there, but we don't give a lot of credence to it. In our day and age, in our place of the world, we have a way of explaining everything, right? Apart from any kind of spiritual uh, forces or, or spiritual world around us. We can explain everything through, through physical causes, and, and we're much more focused on what we can see and what we can hear and what we can touch and, and empirical things, right? But the Bible's clear that there's a spiritual world around us that influential and has an impact on our lives. In Ephesians chapter 6, Paul writes this in verse 12. He says, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities and against the cosmic powers or world forces of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And John warns his readers here that many false prophets, many false teachers are out in the world fighting for influence and fighting to gain followers, fighting to have people buy into and believe what they're teaching. But he goes a step further than that. To explain them, to explain these false prophets, he says that they're, motivi they're motivated and they're being used by these very spirits that Paul's talking about. One commentator, John Stott, writes this. He says, every prophet or every teacher is the mouthpiece or the spokesman for some spirit. So behind every prophet is a spirit and behind every spirit is either God or the devil. The situation as it was in, Paul, in, in John's day here uh, in this letter is, is very similar, the same to how it is for us today. We're constantly bombarded with different messages competing for our allegiance. Knowingly or unknowingly, the messengers, the, the sources of these messages are these spiritual forces that are behind them. The rulers and the authorities and the cosmic powers and the spiritual forces that really do exist and really are working against the purposes of God. God. John tells his readers how to distinguish between these evil spirits and these false teachers and these worldly ideas and the Holy Spirit of God. He tells us how to make that distinction. The key test, he says, comes down to what they profess, what they believe, what they teach about Jesus. Is Jesus the Son? Is Jesus the second person of the Trinity, the Christ, who's come down in the flesh, 
taking on humanity to save us and to cleanse us from our sins. That's the distinguishing mark between true biblical godly Christianity and every other philosophy, every other idea, every other belief. The key question, who is Jesus? Who do you say that Jesus is? What do you believe? What do you claim about Jesus? There were people in John's day and in the, in the early church right after John who believed that Jesus was, really was fully God. He really was God, but he wasn't really human. He just seemed to be human. He just appeared to be human. He was a spirit. He wasn't really physical, right? Think back to how John starts off his letter in, in chapter 1. He makes a point to talk about how, how Jesus really is physically a human, right? He says, what was from the beginning and what we have heard and what we have seen with our eyes and what we've looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life and the life was manifested and we have seen him and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. What we have seen and what we have heard, that we proclaim to you also so that you too may have fellowship with us and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Paul, uh, John here is focusing on the fact that this Jesus that we're, that we're preaching to you, this Jesus that we're talking to you about, we touched him with our hands. We felt him with our hands. We heard him with our ears. We saw him with our eyes. He really, he really was a man. He really became a human. And one of the reasons he's emphasizing that is because there were some false teachers in his day that denied that. There were other false teachers in the early church that, that believed that Jesus really was a man. He really was fully a man, but he wasn't really God. He wasn't fully God. There's some that said that at Jesus' baptism, uh, Jesus was just a man that was born just like we were born. He wasn't born of a virgin, just like, just like us, born the regular way. And at his baptism, the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of Christ came upon him and kind of overtook him. And Jesus lived the rest of his life empowered by that Spirit. And then at some point on the cross, before he died, the Spirit left him. And he died as a, as a mere human again. There were others who taught that uh, that, that, that Jesus was kind of a mixture between God and man. He was, a, he was maybe a, a human body with a, with a divine mind or, or something like that. Others taught that Jesus was, was two separate persons in, in one body. He was fully human and fully God, uh, but, but, but those unions were, uh, or those, those natures were, were completely separate. And so in some parts of Jesus' life, you see him acting as a man, and in some parts of Jesus' life, you see him acting as a, as a human. This, this was a problem. Many people going around to these different churches teaching these false things about who Jesus is. And John says the way that you can tell if they're true or false is by what they say about Jesus. The early church got together and uh, had, a, had, a, had several conferences and meetings, and they discussed, and they studied the, the word and remembered what the apostles had, had taught them, and and they, they came up with some statements of, of this is what we believe the Bible teaches about Jesus. There's some, some famous statements throughout church history that, that help us to, to look that, at that today. That was in the early church. That was in John's time. But today, many people claim different things about Jesus as well. We have many messages coming to us all the time about who Jesus is. Some of those messages, not, not a whole lot, but a few of those messages deny that Jesus was even a person at all. Some people say Jesus never even existed. He wasn't a real person. He's a, he's a fable or a legend. Some say he's this, this kind of composite figure based on all these kind of early church or first century Jewish teachers and, and moral philosophers, and, and, and they've kind of taken parts of different ones and kind of put them all together, and here's this representative Jesus, who's not a real person at all, but a fictional person. Others don't deny that he was a real person, but they deny that he was the son of God. They deny that he existed for all eternity and then came in the flesh. Often around Christmas or Easter time on the Discovery Channel or the History Channel or other, other TV channels like this, you'll see TV shows about these kind of things. The search for the historical Jesus, right? We want to get past the Christ of the Bible and who was really the Jesus of, of history? Who was this man? What can we really know about this man? They think he was just a man like us. He might have been a, 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 an influential philosopher or a, or a moral teacher. He might have been a political revolutionary who, who kind of led a, led a movement against the, the Roman Empire and then got killed for it. 
Some, even if you remember the Pharisees, some even said that they thought he was demon-possessed. He was just a man like us, but he was demon-possessed, remember? They said the reason or the way that he's able to, to drive demons out, cast demons out of people was by the power of the devil, by the power of Beelzebub, right? And, and what John's helping us to see here, I, I hope he's helping you to see, is that, that these beliefs, these thoughts, these teachings about who Jesus is, they, they, don't just, they don't just arise out of people's minds or people's thinking. Jesus says that there are spirits behind this, the spirit of the Antichrist. And when we hear the word Antichrist, often we think about the, this, this person from the end times, right? We just finished preaching through Revelation not long ago. When we hear Antichrist, we think about someone who's going to appear at the, at the end, of, end of history and, and that kind of thing. And, but, but here John says that there are many Antichrists that have already come. And to be Antichrist just means anyone who's against Christ, literally anti Christ, anti-Jesus, anyone or any spirit or any thought or ideology or philosophy or belief that is against Christ is antichrist. Sometimes you hear people talk about the spirit of our age, right? The spirit of our age. The spirit of our age leads so many people away from Jesus, leads so many people to the wrong views, the wrong thoughts about Jesus. Some today still look to him as a, as a moral leader or a revolutionary, someone to be followed, someone to be learned from. Some today would, would say maybe at one point he was like that, but he was kind of a, a man of his times, and he's behind the times now, right? Morality has, has progressed beyond even what Jesus taught. Uh, some even would look to Jesus and say, yeah, maybe he was a, a good, mor- good moral leader in his time, good moral teacher in his time, but the times have kind of passed him up and And now some of the things that he said then, we need to move beyond that, move past that. Some of the things that he said then, we think are immoral today. Some people might even look to Jesus as like a a bigot. Others mock Jesus. Others today mock Jesus. Not to pick on any one group, but, but June is Pride Month, right? And many in our world today would look to Jesus and say that, that the biblical view of Jesus, the, the view of Jesus that, that, that we believe and preach is, is not, a, not a Jesus of love, not a God of love, but a God of hatred. And if we or he teaches anything different than what they would believe or how they would want to live, that's not, a, that's not loving, that's hatred toward them. Many today can't really abide by the exclusive nature of, of Jesus' claims, right? If, if Christianity really is true, if what the Bible says really is true, then everything else is not true. Everything else is false. Because the Bible says there's only one God and there's only one way to him. It's through his son Jesus. If that's true, that means everything else is wrong. And many today cannot abide by that cannot accept that. Many today, the spirit of our age, many today say that reality really doesn't work like that at all, right? They're fine to say, in, in some cases at least, they're fine to say that Christianity or that Jesus is, is true for, for you maybe, if it works for you. But any other belief, even a belief that's contradictory, can also be true for other people. There's no real objective reality. There's no real objective truth. What's true for you is true for you. What's true for me is true for me. You hear phrases like, live your truth. Right? And these ideas are so dangerous, even to to us in the church. They're so dangerous because they don't just come to us as, as philosophies or as teachings. They if that were the truth, if they only came to us as philosophies or teachings, then we could kind of be on guard and be watching out for it because we know that anytime someone begins to teach us something, then we need to, to be on, on the watch for it, on the lookout for it, right? But these philosophies and ideas don't, don't just come that way. They often catch us when we're not watching for them, when we're not on guard. They, they, they come to us in the music that we listen to. They come to us in the, in the TV shows that we watch. They come to us in the novels that we read. They come to us in politics. They come to us through, through podcasts and comedians. 
through trainings and policies that work sometimes. They come to us through movies, commercials, and ads. They come to us through marketing campaigns and, and through jokes and, and so many other ways that we're not often expecting. And they're dangerous because they can have an impact even when we're not thinking about it. They can have an impact especially when we're not thinking about it, when we're not on guard, when we're not watching out. And John helps us understand that these are not just differences in how people understand the reality of the world around us. There's a spiritual battle happening all around us. And Satan and his spiritual forces and the rulers and authorities, they use people and institutions and ideas as pawns in their fight against the Lord Jesus. The battle doesn't just involve the spirit of our age, it does, but not just the spirit of our age. It's been raging for, for thousands of years. It's been going on for a long time. Ever since, uh, ever since Satan uttered his first words to Eve in the in the garden in Genesis 3. And sometimes they come to us as ideas that are hostile to God, openly hostile to God, and openly hostile to Jesus. But they also come to us sometimes wrapped in religious concepts and attempts to please God. There's lots of ideas of how to get to God and how to please God. Lots of different people have taught how we might approach God and yet there's only one way to get to God. In Judaism, we learn that they really think that they're serving the Lord. They really think that they're serving God. They're zealous to serve the Lord. They're zealous to serve God and love him. And because of that, they reject Jesus as the Messiah. They say that he's not really the Christ. He's not really the Messiah. He's not really the, the son sent down from heaven to save us from our sins. In John 4, verse 6, the last verse that we're looking at today, he says, We are from God. He who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Some translations may say the spirit of deception. Satan is working to deceive us. He's working to deceive people and turn people away from the Lord. And often the way he does that is by making them think that they really are serving God. And they're not. In Islam, they honor Jesus as a, as a prophet. They honor him as one of, the, one of the highest prophets, other than Muhammad. But they don't think he's God. They don't think he's the Messiah. They don't think he's the, the Savior. When I was thinking about that, I was reminded of a quote that I heard one time in a sermon by Adrian Rogers, who was the longtime pastor at Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis. There was a sermon he was preaching in he said, Jesus is not looking for admirers who will tip their hats to him. He's looking for worshipers who will bow their knees. He's not looking for admirers that will think he's a great prophet or a good guy. He's looking for worshipers who will bow their knee. In Buddhism, they believe Jesus is an enlightened spiritual leader, but he's not God. He's not a savior. In Hinduism, they're happy to accept Jesus as God. They say, yeah, absolutely, Jesus is God. Just add him to the list of all the other gods that we have, and we'll worship him right alongside all the others. But there's nothing, nothing special about him. There's a, there's a religion called Baha'i. Baha'i says that Jesus is a, he, he really is a manifestation, an appearance of God. He really is. But he's not the only one. He's just one of many manifestations of God that have happened throughout history. And that he came to advance human morals and, and civilization. But since Jesus, other manifestations of God have shown up on, on the scene, and they've taken us beyond what Jesus taught. They've advanced our human morality beyond what Jesus led it to, and they've helped human civilization beyond that. Often you may see people walking down the street, or perhaps they've come to your house, Jehovah's Witnesses. They believe Jesus is a spiritual being, higher than the angels, but not quite God. He was created in heaven. He's not eternal. Mormons or the Church of Jesus Christ and Latter-day Saints, they believe that Jesus is the, is the spiritual brother of Satan, that he and Satan are brothers. They're both sons of God, but neither of them are eternal. Both of them were born spiritually in heaven. They say that Jesus progressed and grew into 
into Godhood just like God his Father did before him and just like we can in the future. They, they believe that Jesus died for sin, that, that people are saved through trusting in Jesus for forgiveness for their sins and also by following his example and living the way he did. We need both. We add our works to what he has done for us. And again, I think many people in, in these groups may be sincere in what they're saying, may be sincere in what they're believing and thinking. They think they're loving and worshiping the true God, but they're deceived by the many antichrist spirits and the many teachers and preachers and leaders, they're deceiving. Many of you know the name Albert Moeller, the, the president of Southern Seminary here in Louisville. He was asked a question, and here's, here's the answer he gave. Dr. Moeller said, well, I would have to say as a Christian that I believe any belief system, any worldview, whether it's Zen Buddhism or Hinduism or dialectical materialism for that matter, Marxism, any belief system that keeps people captive and keeps them from coming to uh, faith in God, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, yes, that's a demonstration of satanic power. And that's what John's telling us here. Often we think of, of satanic power as being someone has to be possessed by a demon, right? Like we see in the Bible sometimes, or like we've heard about in, 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 in history, or like we see on uh, the exorcism movies, the exorcist movies, right? Stuff, stuff like that. Someone has to be possessed by a demon and act crazy and, and, and speak in different languages, all these kind of, kind of crazy things. And, and yet John's saying, no, it's much more subtle than that. Much more subtle than that. There are many false teachers that have gone out among you and the, the spirits of Antichrist, the spirit of, of Satan and those who follow him are using those false teachers to lead people away from Christ are using those false beliefs, those false systems of belief to turn people away from following and worshiping the true Jesus. This is dangerous. And it's really dangerous because often this deception even comes through many claiming the name of Christ. There are many false teachers in the world and they're trying to get footholds in churches. John says, test the spirits. There's some Christian groups who claim and that, that believing in Jesus and trusting him alone is not enough. There's some who say, yeah, you need to trust in Jesus, believe in Jesus, but you also need to be a part of our specific church or our specific type of churches. Otherwise, you're not really saved. There's several groups that teach that. There's some groups who believe, uh, believe in, in, in Jesus and trusting him alone is, is not enough. They say you must also speak in a spiritual language. And if you don't speak in a spiritual language, then that is evidence that you have not received the Holy Spirit. And that means that you are not one of Jesus's. Other groups say that Jesus's death on the cross is really, really not that important. It's not, it's not what saves us. He didn't die for us to, to pay the, the penalty for our sins or something like that. A loving father wouldn't, wouldn't send his son to do that, they say. Jesus's life and even his death serve as an example to us. Of, uh, of how we should live, an example that we should follow in our own lives to show that we're worthy of becoming God's people. What happens in heaven is not really that important, whether we get to heaven or not. What's really important is how do we live here and now? We have an opportunity to, to, to make heaven on earth, they say. There's another group that promised that we'll have no trouble in the world. And if you do have trouble, if you have a lack of money or a lack of sickness or, 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 I'm sorry, if you have a lack of money or if you are sick or have other problems, that's evidence that, that, that your faith is just not strong enough. Your faith is not great enough. And if you had greater faith, then God would bless you with material blessings. Again, Dr. Moeller says the problem with prosperity theology is not that it promises too much, but that it aims for so little. What God promises us in Christ is far above anything that can be measured in earthly wealth. And believers are not promised earthly wealth or the gift of health even. John tells us that there are false teachers all around us, some outside the church and some inside the church. Many of them are sincere, but sincerely deceived. Others are malicious and hostile toward God, outrightly so. 
But he says all of them, no matter, all of them are being used by spirits who are anti-Christ, spirits who are against Jesus, spirits who are opposing the purpose and plan of God. And that's true today, even as it was true then when John wrote these words. We're being barraged by the world, by other religions, even by those who claim the name of Christ. And I'm telling you this morning, John tells us this morning, we can't trust every teacher. We can't trust every spirit. We must be discerning. We must test the spirits. We can't trust every author or book or Christian musician who claim the name of Christ. Some of the most, uh, so, some of the most best-selling Christian authors, some of the most well-known Christian preachers, some of the biggest names in Christian music, even some of the biggest sources of, of music for churches to use in worship services are not fully trustworthy. We must test the spirits to see if they are of Christ or if they're antichrist. This, uh, this sermon has been pretty discouraging so far, I would say. Uh, but John doesn't leave it that way. He has some encouraging words for us also. In the second half of this passage, he says this, starting in verse 4, he says, You are from God, little children, and you have overcome them, because greater is he who is in you than the one who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak as from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. He who knows God listens to us, and he who is not from God does not listen to us. And by this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. John says, greater is he who is in you, if you're a believer. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. In John chapter 16, John quotes Jesus saying this, I have said these things to you that, you may, uh, that in me you may have peace. He says, in the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. John tells us to look out, to watch out for, to be on the, on the lookout for false teachers that are motivated by false, pro, false spirits. But here he tells us to look in, to look in. He doesn't tell us to look into ourselves, right? You might hear sometimes, just follow your heart, just, just do what your heart tells you to do. That's terrible advice, the worst advice. Do not, you would be much safer if you consider what your heart says and did the opposite than if you consider what your heart says and just follow what your heart says, right? That's not what he means. He doesn't say look into yourself. He tells us to look into the one who's in us. We have not overcome the world, but he says the one who is in us has overcome the world. It's already happened. It's a done deal. He has overcome the world. Another commentator, uh, Dr. Aiken, says this. He says, the world is the devil's domain, and its philosophy is an expression of his values and his agenda. He attempts to kill, steal, and destroy, but he's rendered powerless by the greater spirit of God who lives within the believer. Satan, Antichrist, and the false prophets are no match for God. They're no match for God in us. They're dangerous. These false philosophies, these false teachings, they're dangerous. We need to watch out for them, look out for them. But greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Another commentator, Stephen Smalley, suggests that this battle is not only raging in the, in the church community, right? False teachers going around to different churches. It's not just raging in the, in the church community, but it's also raging in the very heart of every believer. Who are we going to believe? Who are we going to look to? What message are we going to subscribe to? The false teachers, John says, are from the world. They speak from the world's point of view with the same Antichrist values, and he says the world hears them. The world listens to them. But he says believers are from God. Believers have the Holy Spirit. Believers hear the truth of God. I think about Jesus often in the Gospels when he would, he would say something, and then he would say, he who has ears to hear, let him hear, right? The world listens to the voice of the world. The, the, the world listens to the values of the world. The believer who has the Holy Spirit living in us listens to the word of God. Jesus says he's the good shepherd over the flock of God, and those who are his people hear his voice and listen to him. Believers hear his voice as he speaks in his word. And the Holy Spirit convinces them of its truth and applies it to their hearts. 
Believers are from God. Believers have the Holy Spirit living inside of them. The Spirit of Christ, not the Spirit of Antichrist. Believers are changed people. Believers are no longer attracted by the world's values and the world's ways of thinking. This is how we can test the spirits. This is how we can recognize their error. We test what we hear and read and see, and we compare it to the truth found in God's word as the Holy Spirit bears witness to us, as the Holy Spirit confirms to us the truth of his word and applies it to our hearts. So I want to leave you this morning with two questions. The first question is, what do you believe about Jesus? What do you believe about Jesus? And it may be different than what our church's kind of official statement about Jesus is. I'm asking you to to kind of examine yourself, examine your heart. Not just what do you say you believe, but what do you live like you believe? What do you believe about Jesus? you believe he was, a, he was a nice guy that we can kind of look up to and learn some things from? you believe he was an important figure from, from history? you think he was a good moral teacher and you can try to emulate him in, in your relationships? you think he was a, a, a wise philosopher that you can pattern your life after and gain happiness and success and have a good life? Do you think he's an example that you try to follow and do what he did so that God will be pleased with you the way that God was pleased with him? Or is he the son of God, the Lord of creation, who rules over creation? Is he your savior that you're putting all your trust in, you're putting all your hope in, as your only hope for being cleansed of your sins and being accepted before God? Who do you believe Jesus is? What do you believe about Jesus? And the second question, what are you listening to? Or who are you listening to? What are you listening to? Or who are you listening to? I'm not saying you need to go out and burn all your non-Christian music, right? I I, I listen to non-Christian music. I'm not saying that at all. When I say who are you listening to, I mean who are you you buying into? What are you buying into? What are you? What ideas, what, what, what philosophies, what, what thinking are you connecting to? Are you discerning about the preachers that you listen to? The books that you read? The music you listen to and the entertainment that you enjoy? Do you ever even think about the message that they're trying to get you to buy into? Do you compare those messages with what God has to say in his word. I hope that you do. We're about to sing our final song this morning. As we do, there'll be an opportunity for you to respond to what you've heard here this morning. Perhaps you're here, maybe you've been here for a long time. Maybe you've attended every Sunday for for years and years and years and years and years. And yet you're thinking that you've never really bought into who Jesus really is. Maybe this is your first time ever to be in a church ever your whole life. And this is the first time you've ever heard anything about the Lord Jesus. If you want to talk more about trusting in him, believing in him, about how his life earned righteousness for us before God, how his death takes away the guilt of our sin before God, and we can be cleansed from that sin, I'd love to, to talk to you. Maybe you're here, maybe you've been attending for a while now and you believe in Jesus, you believe what the Bible says about him, you trust in him, uh, and, and, and you're thinking it's time to, to join with us. It's time to officially become a part of us, a, a part of this body, that together we might discern truth from error, that together we might seek to understand what the Lord says in his word, that together we might seek to, to follow him and to avoid the, the landmines around us in the world. I'd invite you to come up and we can have a conversation about that as well. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for your word this morning. God, we thank you that you are true and that you speak to us. And God, I pray you would help us to resist the temptations we find around us. Father, temptations to act simply, but also temptation to believe wrongly and to think wrongly. God, I pray you'd help us to be discerning about the messages that we're receiving from the world around us. God, I pray you'd help us to be sensitive to the promptings of your Holy Spirit as he's speaking to us through your word. God, I pray that you would keep us faithful. Help us to keep one another faithful. 
as your spirit's working here among us individually and among our church. God, we thank you so much for our Lord Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.